Hey guys, just a quick note before we start things off here. Um, as you can see, the chair that I normally use to, well, record pretty much most of my videos is, uh, well, it's no more. That being said, uh, I'll have a vlog later this week that'll explain everything. But uh, this is why I am filming in the computer room and not my normal room. Okay, on with the show. In early 2003, renowned comic creator Michael Turner founded Aspen MLT Entertainment. Turner had gained fame at Top Cow, drawing one of the Image subsidiary's flagship titles, Witchblade. He then moved on to a creator-owned series called Fathom, whose main character, Aspen Matthews, served as the namesake for Aspen Comics. And if any of you recall my old comic unboxing show, then you may recall Aspen's flagship title, Soulfire, popping up on occasion. And yeah, Michael Turner's art definitely does fall firmly into the category of being cheesecake. Or in other words, he liked showing very pretty girls in very little clothing. And the same holds true for Turner's protégés. I mean, in today's entry, there were a lot of images I had to debate whether or not I could actually show them. I mean, they're not nude in the strictest sense of the term, but they did kind of push the limit of being nude. I mean, trying to create a thumbnail for this episode was impossible. The pictures I used, those were kind of the tamest ones I could find. Getting back on topic, Aspen would eventually venture into mainstream comics with Turner penciling an arc on Batman Superman that introduced a new Supergirl. Turner's protégés worked on titles like a four-part Superman story, a relaunch of Wildstorm's Gen 13 comic, and the infamous Rise of Arsenal. The latter being known as the book where Roy Harper wielded a dead cat as a weapon and then tried to hook up with a strange girlfriend, Cheshire, only to, pun not fully intended, fail to rise to the occasion. Sadly, Michael Turner passed away in 2008 after a long battle with bone cancer. But Aspen Entertainment would march on in Turner's memory, launching a book about a Chinese woman named Iris. Iris was an executive assistant for a Chinese-American businessman named Ching. Iris acted not only as a personal secretary, but also as a bodyguard and assassin, who Ching would dispatch to take care of his international interests. Iris was the product of a special Chinese academy that trained young women into becoming executive assistants, or in other words, secretaries that doubled as bodyguards slash assassins slash hit people slash thieves. And along the way, each of the students at the academy would be assigned a flower-based codename. Iris would go on several missions for Ching, even encountering fellow executive assistants. However, a relationship with a young man named Dennis Rucker, because of course a guy is involved in this, would open Iris's eyes to the idea that Ching's motives were not as pure as the driven snow. Iris would rebel against Ching and break away to work on her own by freelancing as a black ops agent for the CIA. Iris' adventures proved popular enough that Aspen Entertainment eventually decided to use the other executive assistants as the foundation for the publisher's first ever ongoing title. And today, we're looking at the first 19 issues of that title. This is the Executive Assistant Assassin's Omnibus, Volume 1. 
In Xinjiang, China, two young girls named Dandelion and Camilla admire an assortment of flowers. It's an important day at the academy as the headmistress, Lilac, is giving a new client a tour. The client, named Tarver, talks briefly with Dandelion before leaving with Lilac and inquiring about a disgraced academy student named Lily. Lilac says that even the executive academy isn't perfect and quickly takes Tarver over to where the academy's elders train. As for Lily, she currently lives in the Shinjuku district of Japan where the disgraced student works as a stripper. When a few patrons start to get a little too grabby, Lily falls back on her fighting skills to take out an entire club, except for one quiet man named Kato who simply takes his leave. This results in Lily getting fired as it's not the first time she's caused a bar fight. Lily was a classmate slash rival of Iris while the two were at the Executive Academy. Her disgrace came when Iris bested her in combat even though Lily was supposed to be the more advanced student. Eventually, years later, the two would team up again while Iris was working for Mr. Ching. Lily cooks up her last dose of heroin to drown her sorrows and passes out in the club's dressing room. She comes to on the front steps of the club and returns to her apartment to find out she's already been evicted. It's then that Kato arrives with a group of men. Lily realizes that the men are after her and tries to flee, but the numbers catch up and she is quickly subdued. Kaito is under the employ of a weapons manufacturer named Mizutsu. He has an interest not only in Lily, but also Iris and the other executives, as it turns out that Tarver is also in Mizutsu's employ. Tarver gives Mizutsu the exact location of the academy, and Mizutsu initiates his grand plan. The next morning at the executive academy, Dandelion and Camilla admire the sunrise, only to be killed when several remote bomber drones attack and destroy the building. The reason Mizutsu hates the executive assistant so much is the fact that their effectiveness has hurt the profits of his weapons manufacturing company, which, although never overtly stated, does appear to actually be illegal. Meanwhile, Kaito has taken Lily out to a field in China where her grave has been pre-dug. Before he can execute her, though, Kaito is killed by one of his men. The man then takes out the other goons and takes Lily to a safe house. He introduces himself as Agent Cope of the CIA. Lily's not interested in joining any government agency, but Cope explains the two have a mutual enemy, Mazutsu, who has been on the agency watch list for years. Mazutsu has been amassing power with several governments by killing CIA informants, including Lily's former employer, Takeo. Mazutsu also had an executive assistant of his own, but it ended badly. Cope offers to help Lily kick Harrow in cold turkey so that she can be more effective fire. Then, he and Lily will work on taking out Mizutsu. Over the next few days, Cope endures Lily's detoxing, vomiting, and mood swings, slowly earning her respect along the way. Meanwhile, Tarver talks with his wife. He's been planning on leaving Mizutsu's organization for a while, and promises to explain everything as soon as his family is safe. He returns to work to the news about Kaito being dead and Cope running off with Lily. Tarver helps Mizutsu kill several suspected moles. Tarver returns home to find he has a guest, Lilac from the Executive Academy. It turns out that she is actually under Mizutsu's employ, and she kills Tarver's wife and son. She then leaves him with the order to take out Lily as Mizutsu's managed to track down the location of Cope's safe house. Tarver arrives at the location of the safe house and blasts Cope through the chest just as he and Lily are preparing to exit. Distraught, but with no other choice, Lily uses Cope's body as a distraction for her to scale the building Tarver is standing on. She takes down Tarver with a kick, but this merely allows him to activate the self-destruct on his weapon. She dodges the explosion and corners Tarver on the edge of the roof. Tarver says that Mizutsu will never give up as Lily kicks him off the roof to his death. Lily then vows to take down Mizutsu. At this point in the book, we divert from the main plot to tell a two-part story of an executive assistant named Sephora. Sephora was young when a pirate named Takote came to the academy and purchased her services. Takote's actions allowed Sephora to see the ocean for the first time, leading to a fascination. Takote used Sephora for two things, killing adversaries, including other pirates, and keeping the men on board in check. Takote even went as far as to forbid any of his men from taking advantage of Sephora, including himself. That was until a new recruit named Landing came aboard. Sephora resisted his charms at first, but the two eventually began a torrid romance. Knowing that Takote would never approve, Landing began plotting a mutiny. However, Takote discovered the plan and ordered Sophia to kill Landon or be killed herself. Sephora chose to turn on Takote and blast it away on Landon's bonds. The two then worked together to take down the rest of the crew and eventually Takote. Sephora leaving the captain with a message. He broke the agreement, not her. Landon and Sephora then stopped on a nearby island. However, she knew that they wouldn't last as a couple and quietly set the young man out to sea on a ship without her. She then stayed behind on the island. Now back to the main plot. 
Lily does her best to stay hidden as Lila comes to retrieve Tarver's body. She then tails the turncoat executive assistant to London and breaks into her apartment. Lily pulls a gun and Lilac pulls a Rottweiler. Lily is forced to kill the dog while Lilac grabs a sword. The two fight with Lilac appearing to gain the upper hand only for Lily to stab Lilac in the throat and send her crashing through a window and falling to her death. Lily then calls Mizutsu to say he's next. Lily then travels to New York City to meet up with the one person she knows she can trust, Iris. Lily starts to explain what's going on but Iris already knows about Mizutsu. It turns out that Iris has been freelancing for the CIA. Memories of what happened to Cope cause Lily to back away and leave before Iris can deliver a final message. Meanwhile, Mizutsu takes Lilac's body back to Japan. It's then that he's approached by another executive assistant who also wants Lily's head, Rose. I couldn't figure out whether or not Rose was actually a classmate of Iris and Lily, but she did appear in the story where the two met up for the first time since their days in the Academy. Back in New York City, Lily meets up with two other executive assistants, Aster and Orchid. The latter having recently freed herself from being controlled via microchip by one of Mizutsu's allies. Mizutsu dispatches Rose to retrieve and possibly kill Orchid and the others. Rose then sets up a trap where she thinks the trio might go for weapons. In Alwar, India, an executive assistant named Lotus is rushed out of bed by her tiger being disturbed. She ventures outside where Rose tosses two gas grenades at Lotus. Rose then tases Lotus' as tiger and the two women fight, only for it to be interrupted by the arrival of Lily, Aster, and Orchid. Rose then takes the three on and puts up a good fight until Iris arrives. Iris and the others then tie up Rose and begin pumping her for information by threatening her with water intoxication, which is force-feeding water to the victim until they drown. However, the interrogation is interrupted by an explosion. The person behind the attack then knocks out Lotus, Lily, and Aster before revealing herself to Iris. The woman merely introduces herself as an executive assistant before knocking out Iris and then freeing Rose. The two then leave together. Sometime later, Lily and the others try to regroup. Iris elects to drop out, citing Lily's resistance to accept CIA help earlier, and Lotus needs to stay behind so that she can rebuild her home. The executive assistant who freed Rose is named Ivy, and yeah, I didn't find this out right away. In fact, a lot of the characters in this book are not introduced very well. The only way I figured out some of their names is because they pop up in the summary pages to the next issue. Ivy takes Rose to an apartment in New Delhi. They don't get any time to rest, though, as word has gotten to Mizutsu about Rose's disappearance. Fearing that she, too, has turned on him, Mizutsu sends out an army of drones to take out the two. Ivy tries to convince Rose that Mizutsu is not to be trusted, but eventually Rose decides to return to Mizutsu. Upon her return, Rose mentions Ivy to Mizutsu. The mere mention of Rose's savior upsets Mizutsu. He explains that Ivy was the executive assistant that he hired and eventually fell in love with. That is until Mizutsu began trying to create telepathically enhanced super soldiers. Ivy sold Mizutsu out, and when he confronted her, she left him in a bloody heap. Since then, Mizutsu has trained every day for the day he could kill her herself. Meanwhile, Lily, Aster, and Orchid scope out a new base of operations in Japan. The trio began planning out an attack on Mizutsu when Ivy arrives. She tries to ease the tensions by offering Mizutsu's locations. However, Orchid then pulls a gun on the others. It turns out that she was still working for Mizutsu and the microchip was not actually turned off. Now he knows where they are located. Mizutsu's forces descend on the warehouse as Ivy knocks out Orchid and tear gas begins filling the building. In the melee, Rose grabs hold of Ivy with Lily taking aim at her. Unable to get a good shot though, Lily lowers the gun and Rose knocks Ivy out. Lily and Rose begin fighting as Aster pulls Ivy to safety. Lily begins to get the upper hand when a shot rings out and Mizutsu holds a smoking gun as Lily falls dead. Ivy and Aster then give pursuit, but Mizutsu and Rose get away. Ivy and Aster go to New York City, where they meet up with Iris and Lotus. The latter two are willing to put aside the previous incident to take down Mizutsu in Lily's honor. To the best of my research, this is where the main plot of Executive Assistant Assassins ends. However, that's not the end of this book as the rest of it is spent introducing new assassins. Well, somewhat new assassins, as the first assassin is Lotus. Twenty years earlier, Rani, the young girl who would become Lotus, grew up the daughter of an Indian crime lord. Her mother abandoned her at the age of two, and Rani grew up wanting to be a scientist, which her father encouraged, but he also felt the need to train her in the art of combat. As the years passed, Rani's skills in both science and fighting increased. She even developed a new type of smoke grenade, which could be remotely detonated. On her 18th birthday, Ronnie's father presented her with a lotus necklace that belonged to her mother. 
One night, everything changed as Ronnie was rousted out of bed by her father. A contract had been put out on his life, and the two would have to leave their home. The two tried laying low on an isolated cabin, but a few nights later, Ronnie woke to find her father dead. Vowing revenge, Ronnie set out after her father's competition. She eventually learned that the hit was put out by someone known as the Tiger. The Tiger turned out to be a notorious recluse. There wasn't even any photo evidence of this person existing, so Ronnie was forced to lay bait for the killer. Ronnie returned to her home as a woman arrived. This was the Tiger, a.k.a. Ronnie's mother. She wanted a life of her own, so when she abandoned her husband, she took up his job as well to try to outdo him. Now, Ronnie is also a competition that needs to be dealt with. The two begin fighting, with the tiger mopping the floor with Ronnie. Eventually, Ronnie conceded defeat and gave her mother the lotus necklace, a necklace that Ronnie had modified into an explosive that could be remotely detonated. Afterwards, Ronnie left to join the Executive Academy, taking the name Lotus and keeping a tiger at her side. The next Executive Assistant Assassin story arc covers a young assassin named Daisy. Daisy grew up in New Orleans, the daughter of a local crime boss. Her father was abusive and strict, blaming Daisy for the death of her mother and accusing her of sleeping around. Daisy wanted to leave, but she could never work up the courage. That is, until she met Shen. Shen was a drug runner working for the Chinese triad, who took Daisy in after a confrontation that left both her and her father bloody. Daisy and Shen fell in love almost from the start and were soon living together. Obviously, Daisy's father didn't approve and dispatched a group of goons to bring her back. Daisy lashed out, tackling one of the goons and tearing out his throat, while Shen took out the other two. With New Orleans no longer safe for either of them, Shen took Daisy back to China, proposing marriage shortly before they left. However, Daisy's father was still able to track the two. Daisy and Shen arrived in China, and after seeing what she did in the alley, Shen knew that Daisy had the skill and tenacity, but lacked the focus. So, Shen took Daisy to the Executive Academy, where she could harness her true potential. Daisy was at a disadvantage at the Academy from day one, being both a foreigner and older than most new trainees. This meant that she was often the punching bag during training. Slowly, Daisy would begin working her way up, but only succeeding whenever she was in a hyper-emotional state. She still lacked focus. Daisy managed to do well enough to graduate and reunite with Shen. However, the night before the ceremony, the girls in Daisy's class, along with Nareen, the Academy headmistress, were brutally slaughtered by a hitman sent by Daisy's father. The hitman then came after Shen and Daisy, interrupting a deal the two were making. In the process, Shen was shot several times, and Daisy killed the hitman and got Shen to the hospital. Shen lived, but Daisy knew what she needed to do. Daisy made her way back to New Orleans and her father's estate. She made sure to take out his guards and personal advisors before confronting dear old dad. However, Daisy did not charge wildly as she had done before. Instead, she lured her father in with a false sense of calm and then plunged several throwing knives into her father's body. Daisy returned to China and Shen, understanding what it truly meant to have focus. She also knew that as long as Shen was in her life, she could never truly regain that focus. Knowing that Shen would never let her leave, Daisy knew what she needed to do. She told Shen she loved him before slitting his throat and leaving the hospital. Our final story of the book covers the origins of the Executive Academy and the people who founded it. Beginning in 1968 China, two Japanese sisters named Mayu and Hana eke out a living on the streets after the death of their invalid father, with Maya often stealing to feed the two sisters. Over the next 13 years, Hana has come up in the world and become a martial arts trainer, while Mayu has not really given up a life of crime. One day, Hana was approached by a childhood friend named Lee. Lee was a powerful member in the pharmaceutical industry and had been receiving threats from his competitors. He was looking for protection from someone he can trust, namely Hana. She turns him down, citing that she just doesn't have the nature of a bodyguard. That night, Lee is killed in his office by a hired gun. He believes the killer works for a rival named Renshu, but the hitman denies it. Meanwhile, Mayu gets arrested during a heist after one of her accomplices turns out to be an undercover cop. Hana visits the morgue and gets tipped off about Renshu. Hana visits Renshu at his office and takes down his security team, but stops when he pulls a gun on her. He denies involvement in Lee's death, but Renshu explains that he and Lee were co-workers for the longest time, and Lee grew jealous of Renshu's ability to be promoted over him on several occasions, so he left to do his own thing. Renshu then gives Hana evidence on Lee's killer, a corporate raider named Zhu Kong. Renshu then points out that he knows Mayu was arrested. Turns out that the undercover cop named Chun was actually in Renshu's employ the whole time. Renshu proposes that Hana work for him and Chun to bring down Kong in exchange for Mayu's freedom. The plan is for Hana to pose as a new secretary for Kong, gain his trust, and then take him out. 
it's not going to be easy as Hana is not a trained killer, which means that she'll have to work with Chun on the aspects of working undercover. Along for the ride are Mayu and some of Hana's students. Knowing that this probably won't be a one-time thing and that the two sisters are now permanently under Renshi's employ, Hana chastises her sister for her recklessness as they arrive at an isolated cottage in the country. Over the next few days, Chun educates Hana on how to be an assistant, including possibly having to sleep with Kang should the need arise. The group also comes up with code names, with Hana choosing the name Daffodil and Mayu choosing Dandelion. The plan is then set into motion as Kang's executive secretary is arrested in order to get information on the businessman. She gives it up in exchange for immunity. Meanwhile, Hana and Mayu begin planning of a way to free themselves from permanent servitude to Renshu. Hana is brought on as Kang's executive assistant, but she alters the plan and kills his head of security and then turns the gun on him. Kong does confess to ordering the hit on Lee, but he has more information. It turns out that Renchu really was involved in Lee's death. Big shock, I know. Hana then kills Kong and returns to the compound to find that Renchu has killed Mayu. Kong's death is all over the news, so Renchu figured out who was behind it. However, Renchu is then killed by Chun. Okay, explanation time here. It turns out that Chun is Lee's ex fiance whom he left back in Seoul, South Korea to return to China because he felt like Mayu and Hana needed him. The two had been sisters to him ever since childhood, so they were very important. This was told in a series of flashbacks that were interwoven throughout the story and really feel sort of out of place, so that's kind of why I skipped over when summarizing them. Chun and Hana begin fighting, with Chun dominating most of the conflict, but Hana's resolve proves strong and she eventually manages to choke Chun to death. Hana then discovers her fighters bound and gagged but alive. Knowing that there's really no place for them in the real world, Hana resolves to find a new calling for all of them as executive assistants. And so ends Executive Assistant Assassin's Omnibus, Volume 1. How was it? Well, on the plus side, I did kind of like the main first story, basically, with Lily assembling the team and going after Mizutsu, and the team decided to carry on in the wake of Lily's death, but that story just stops, and we did, don't get to go back to it. I kind of wanted to see what would happen after it. Instead, we get a lot of filler material. I mean, the ongoing title suddenly becomes an anthology book. Not that there's anything wrong with being an anthology book, but... Really, again, if you're trying to do an ongoing narrative, it seemed to be more important to be focusing on that and not on characters like Sephora and Daisy and the origin of the Academy. I mean, I can see kind of why they did it. It just it doesn't feel like appropriate to this series. It should have been its own supplemental material. Also, the artwork is really uneven. I mean, sometimes they're trying to do grim and gritty, but also do cheesecake. And while it isn't impossible, it is kind of hard to do, and they really fail at that. They're trying way too hard to put the girls in sexy poses rather than, you know, just trying to tell a gritty story. I mean, sometimes you just need to be gritty. Sometimes you just need to do cheesecake, but you can't do both at the same time. Also, like I said, the narrative flow to this really gets interrupted. Like, the Sephora story just comes right in the middle of the Lily arc, and serves no purpose. I don't know if this character comes back. I don't know what role she plays. Yeah, and to be honest, the, the origin story of the Academy at the end is it's just boring. I mean, it's just Hana and Mayu talking, then Chun and Mana t Mayu talking, and then Chun and Hana talking, and then Hana and Renzu talking. It's really not that interesting. And that's why I have to give Executive Assassin's Omnibus Volume 1, or Executive Assistant Assassin's Omnibus Volume 1, sorry, an F. And with that, let's see what we'll be doing next time on the Random Trade Review.
Hey guys, want to recommend a book to be placed in the randomizer, aka the cardboard box? Well, check out my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash sleepy time for cap productions, or just check the link in the description below and see how you can help make that happen.